Hey everybody, John Fenn here, Church Without Walls International, C-W-O-W-I.org. We're a house church network. We're all about the discipleship process. We're practicing church the way they did for the first 300 years, which was to rotate homes and rotate who leads when at all possible so that everybody gets a chance of sharing because we're all we all have Christ in us. We're all temples of the of the living God. We're all living and breathing temples. So when we gather together, uh, while there is someone who leads and we rotate leadership, it is participatory in nature, not sermon oriented. And it's much more like a family reunion uh, getting together. So anyway, check us out, cwowi.org. You can find out a lot of stuff about uh, house church there, some videos, question and answer, various things of that nature. Sign up for my weekly thoughts, which is a weekly email. comes out every Friday, U.S. time, and my monthly e-newsletters. That's where I put any prophetic words, uh, conferences, Zoom meetings, things of that nature. So anyway, cwowi.org. Today, asking the question, what do we do when life seems to contradict uh, the Word of God? What do we do when we are searching uh, the Lord? We are finding, uh, we're walking in as much as we can. We're, we're thinking that we are in his will and life seems to throw contradictions at us. Well, let me give you three examples and uh, it may encourage uh, us and, and to know the ways of the Lord in this. <clears throat> First example this happened to is Abraham, the father of faith, the only one of the Old Testament called the friend of God. And in, we're told in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 10, some, one of my favorite examples, I mention it often, the Lord uh, told Abraham to get out of his land, out of his home, and take a journey. He was going to show him a, a land, a land of promise that he had given to him. Yeah, Stephen tells us in Acts 7, 2, uh, that the Lord actually had appeared to Abram to tell him this. So the Lord appeared to him and said in Genesis 12, 1, get out of your homeland, I'm going to show you another land. And so Abraham took a walk. It was over a thousand miles, some 16, 17, 1800 kilometers at least. And that's just if you go in a straight line to everything the Lord said. So in Genesis 12, 1, he leaves. It's about in, in verses two through six, it's about his journey there. And in verse seven, the Lord appears to him. In verse seven, the Lord appears to him and said, this is the land I was talking about. You found it. And then in verses eight and nine, it's all about, it's about Abraham looking, you know, north, south, east, west, deciding where he's going to live in his new land. And then verse 10 says this, and there was a famine in the land and Abraham had to go down to Egypt in order to live in order to save his life. So the question is, why did the Lord lead him at that time into his promised land, knowing and even appearing to him in verse 7, knowing that in verse 10, there was going to be a famine and he was going to have to leave the land of promise to go to Egypt of all places. Why did the Lord do that? That's that's a contradiction, we would think. Why would the Lord lead me here only to have a famine once I get here? So it tells us that just because there's a famine in the land, it doesn't mean that you're out of God's will. It just means there's a famine and the Lord is leading, but you may have to make uh, rearrangements to your plans. The good news is Abraham came out of Egypt wealthier and better off than when uh, than if he had stayed in his own land. So he came back, and when he came into his promised land, he was actually in a better position in terms of wealth and numbers and everything else to live in the land. Second example, uh, in it's covered in Matthew chapter 14, Mark chapter 6, and John chapter 6, and this is Jesus walking on the water. Now, the situation is that, that he had fed 5,000 men plus women and children. Then he tried to separate himself from all the crowd that was clamoring after him. It was night. He put the disciples into the boat and said, take off to the other side. I'll meet you on the other side in the morning. And Jesus went into a mountain to, prayer, to pray. <clears throat> and the wind rose up and, the, and the, the waves were against him and the wind was, were against them. And they were only about halfway across. Both Matthew and Mark record uh, the distance of, if you measure it, about halfway across the lake. And they saw Jesus walking on the water to them. And and uh, Mark's gospel in Mark chapter 6 says Jesus would have walked on by, but when they were afraid, he diverted and came over to them. Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 14, talks, this is the incident where, where Peter walks on the water. If you look at that in the Greek, and I don't want to get into it here in the full detail, but in the Greek, what Jesus literally said to them was, uh, uh what does he say? Okay, they call out to him thinking it's a ghost. He says, he says, uh, fear not, I am. Now stop being afraid. Uh, basically, fear not, don't worry about it. I am, now stop being afraid. And Peter responded, Lord, if you are, command me to walk on the water. It wasn't, they weren't 
actually questioning if it was a ghost or Peter wasn't questioning if it was a ghost or not. Uh, Jesus made the statement, I am, which means he said, I am the one who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. Peter challenged that and said, if you are, then come to me on the water, then command me to come to you on the water. And of course he did. Now, th this isn't about that. This is about the fact that Jesus sent them away in all likelihood, knowing that their wind and the waves would arise in the middle of the night. So why did Jesus tell them, get to the other side, if he knew there would be wind and waves uh, battering against them? Well, it's a parable of our own lives, where many, many of us feel like the Lord's call on our life, maybe, when you're a teenager or in your 20s, and then life happens. Decades go by. Now you're, you're older and you're thinking, wow, it's too late. I never answered the call of God in my life. And what happened was he sent you on a boat to the other side, and in the midst of it came the wind and the waves, and you've been rowing against it ever since. And the good news is this. John's gospel is the only one who records this. John's gospel in, in John chapter 6, excuse me, in verse 21, says this. When Jesus got into the boat, immediately the boat was at the land where they were headed. So that means that, you know, Mark's gospel says he would have walked on by because Mark's is the gospel of unbelief. If there's anything you, you have questions about people's unbelief, it's Mark's gospel. Matthew's gospel records Peter walking on the water. John's gospel says, but both of those gospels have them still in the middle of the lake, you know, four o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, whatever it is. And, and, uh, and only John's gospel says when Jesus got into the boat, immediately the land was at the land, the, the boat was at the land where they were headed. So that, what that tells us is this you will get to the other side. When Jesus gets into your boat, he trans he makes up for lost time. He immediately will take your boat and put it on the other side. There's no lost time in him. And you got to remember, we live forever and we're already alive forever. So in the, so if you didn't fulfill it here in this age, a lot of, a lot of people are going to see their promises fulfilled 50 years, 100 years, 200 years, 500 years, 700 years from now, when you're alive in the millennial age, and you will fulfill your destiny. How do we know? Because God's word does not return void. It does not return without accomplishing what it was sent. So he's looking at it as, hey, you're alive forever. You're going to rule and reign for a thousand years. So so you, you life happened on the road. The storms happened here. But don't worry, Jesus got into your boat. He's taking you to the other side. You will fulfill your destiny. The other thing, the third point is in John chapter 11, when Jesus is uh, under threat of being murdered by the authorities. So he goes into hiding, but he receives word uh, that Lazarus, his good friend, is sick. And John chapter 11 tells us that he stayed two days where he was after he heard that Lazarus was sick. Then by divine revelation, he tells the disciples, okay, let's go into Judea again. And the disciples, rightly so, look at the circumstances and say, Lord, they, they recently, they tried to kill you. Do you remember that? In fact, Thomas is even so brave. Thomas, who would later doubt, says there, he says, okay, let's go and die with him. You know, Thomas was ready to die with the Lord right there. He insists on going back. That's how convinced they were that if they went back, they would be executed by the authorities. But what happened was this. Jesus responded and he said this, aren't there 12 hours in a day? So if you walk during the daytime, you're not going to stumble because you have light to light your path. But if you're in darkness and try to walk along the path, you're going to stumble because there's no light in you. In other words, Jesus is saying there, I am moving according to divine revelation. And so even though it looks bad, the circumstances look bad, I'm moving according to divine revelation, nothing will happen to us. And so that's a word for us where we are walking along, we think we've got the light of the world in there, we're lighting the way. And all around us, it's like Jesus and the disciples, you know, they're under threat of, of execution by the authorities, but Jesus is walking straight back. He knows, in fact, whatever the two days were, it was waiting for people to be moved or whatever the situation was, but it was two days after he heard Lazarus was sick that he, that he said, okay, let's go. I'm walking in the light now, so nothing's going to harm us. And the good news there, of course, is that he went and he fulfilled his, his promise. He raised Lazarus from the dead and nothing came of it. No, no harm came to him, no arrest or anything at the time, no danger to their lives. And so this is these, these three things, just to sum up, Abraham, there was a famine in the land, but just because a famine is there doesn't mean you missed it. Uh, trust the Lord, set your faith on the fact, hey, I'm in Egypt, I've taken a detour in my life, uh, and so I'm going to trust I'm going to come better off. And And number two, if Jesus you, has you met a detour in life because of the wind and the waves and the storm, when Jesus gets into your boat, you're at the other side. You will fulfill your destiny. He will make up for all that last time, lost time and all that effort to get just halfway across the lake. But boom, once you, he's with you, he, he makes up for it. So you will fulfill your destiny. And number three, if you walk in the light 
that he provides, no matter the circumstances, keep walking in the light. And his, his protection, his buffer zone is all around you to protect. You know, years ago, when uh, someone, when I was an associate pastor at a church and, and had the promise of being that the pastor was going to retire, and then I was going to become the senior pastor of that church, the pastor changed his mind, decided not to retire. And we, everyone knew it was not the Lord's will, but there wasn't anything we could do about it because we were under authority. It was somebody else's decision. And my wife, Barb, was really upset, but she went to prayer. And that night, the Lord spoke to her and said this, and maybe this pertains to you as well. He said this to her. He said, I tried to work through men's hearts, but they wouldn't allow me. So now I have to work around them. And it will mean a detour for you. But because it was through no fault of your own, you will remain in my perfect will. But it will mean a detour. So maybe you've experienced a detour in life, but be like Abraham and set your faith that when you're in Egypt, you're going to be better off for it. Or, or, or if you've had the storms of life, that the Lord gets into your boat and you will fulfill your destiny. He will make up for lost time. And number three, that if you're walking through the darkness and you're walking under threat all around you, if you're walking in the light, then you won't stumble and you'll have that protection. All right, God bless. Even on the detours, look for his provision, look for his grace. It's there. All right, cwowi.org. Thanks.